We own our lives. We take care of our own place in this world and we create our paths. And if something isn't working for us, then we will create another path. But, you know, go in there with self-confidence and be who you are and just own your space. Hello and welcome to the New Rules of Work, a podcast from The Muse where we explore the changing landscape of work. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Cindy Augustine to the show. Cindy is the Global Chief Talent Officer at FCB, one of the largest global advertising agency networks with more than 8,000 employees in 80 countries worldwide. Cindy leads all aspects of human resources, including talent acquisition, change management, compensation, benefits, as well as culture and inclusion programs. Cindy, welcome to the new rules of work. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be with you today. I'd love to just ask you to start by telling us a little bit more about your career path. So how did you end up at FCB? And, you know, for those who don't know you, just introduce us a little bit to how you kind of got to where you are today. I got to being here in a way that I would never have expected in any of my wildest dreams because I, I never would have thought I'd be in corporate America. I would have never thought I would lead HR. I mean, when I was a kid, I thought I would be a musician because just about everybody in my family played an instrument and, uh, you know, was in the arts in some, you know, manner or form. So I never really foresaw this being a career path of mine. I was a practicing attorney for probably, I don't know, close to 15 years. And I was an employment lawyer, which is not what I thought I would do either. When I, <laughs> when I got out of uh, law school, I actually thought I'd be in environmental law and I got to a big law firm and it turned out that the environmental law that they practiced was the other side. Anyway, so I ended up doing employment law at a couple of different law firms. And then I ended up doing uh, employment law at the New York Times, which I have to say was one of my most favorite jobs ever was working at that place. And while I was there, um, you know, you work very closely with HR. It was great doing that. And I got called away somewhere to do um, law at another place. And while I was at this other law firm, the New York Times called me back and asked me, would I be interested in doing HR at the New York Times? And I have to say, at that point in my career, I thought to myself, the problem with being a lawyer is that by the time you are looking at whatever situation you're in, it's too late, right? You have two sides that are adversarial. You have two sides that don't understand each other anymore. And the possibilities of there ever becoming an amicable situation where things could have been saved are long, long past. And I felt that if I was in HR, there was a lot of potential that the kind of litigation that I was seeing and ending up in could have been avoided. So I went back to the New York Times and um, it was actually in the beginning quite a lesson in humility because I had been the HR team there who now was my HR team. They had been my clients when I was a lawyer. So I came in and I said the most arrogant thing you could think of. I said to them, wow, you know, I was, you know, did employment law. So there's probably like a 90% overlap between what I did as a lawyer for you and now being, you know, you know, with you, it's HR, which could not have been further from the truth, which I learned probably, you know, like, I don't know, within three weeks. So, um, because, you know, it's not developing people, it's not compensation, it's not, you know, diversity, it being an employment lawyer was nothing. It was, it was like a fraction of what I needed to do when I was in HR. So I brought my whole team back together and I said, I would like to apologize <laughs> for yep. so misunderstanding what the role really is. And I went from there. Then I did HR in a, in a few different places. I was HR at the New York times and at time Warner at Scholastic. And now at FCB. And I have to say each experience was different, you know, because everybody has a different culture and everything and things are, are more important in different organizations. But I have never once looked back at making the move from being a lawyer into HR, because I think it has been one fantastic move for me and much more where my heart and my feeling of purpose comes from is being in HR. 
And it sounds like that you also love having such a broad role because, you know, there's, there's so many different parts of being an employee that get touched by HR, right? It's bringing people into the company, which is giving them jobs. It's ideally helping people grow, develop, learn, uh, receive feedback, get training. I mean, there's such a kind of broad mandate. And I think it's, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it, a lot of people are attracted to it for that reason. Yeah, it's, it's dynamic. There's never one day that is, you know, the same as, as the next. You meet people coming into the organization, which I've always found fascinating because you meet people from every walk of life coming into all kinds of different jobs. And what's always fascinating to me is how do you think of a job and a person in terms of not just what they've done in the past, but their potential for what they could do in the future? What skills have they actually developed that they don't think of could fit into a different job. There's a lot of sort of systemic work that you do in HR, whether it's the broad talent management stuff, which would include such succession planning or, you know, all of those things. But it's for me, the real energy for me comes when you see somebody, you know, burst out and, uh, and really see what they're capable of doing in the world. That's fun. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's incredible. As you said, with potential at uh, both the opportunity to show someone potential that they perhaps didn't even see in themselves or yeah. the opportunity to work with someone and coach them and give them opportunities where they really, really step into the potential that, um, you know, that, that was there all along. Yes. It's the best part. <laughs> it's probably the most, part of the, the most fun part of the job. <laughs> I totally, I totally agree. And, you know, and I love that overview of your background because I think um, one of the things that I think is so powerful about your role now is as the global chief talent officer, you have a very visible position, obviously within your company, but also within the broader advertising and agency industry. You know, you've been called a role model for many. I read a Q&A recently that introduced you as one of the highest ranking women of color at FCB. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, about this idea of being a, a leader, a role model, someone visible. And, you know, it's, it's always, I think, um, a particularly interesting thing when you come from a group that's, that's not always represented at the highest levels of leadership. You know, I know when I am sometimes on lists of like the top female entrepreneurs, part of me is really proud because I want to inspire so many other women to right. start businesses and to grow. And then part of me is like, well, you know, why isn't it just a list of entrepreneurs? So how do you think about your role as a, as a leader and as someone that inspires so many other people in their careers? I think it's a really interesting question as you're stating it, because I have been around a, a lot of women who, um, who state, I just want to be defined as my role, right? I don't want to be a female CEO. I want to be called a CEO. I understand that. I think for, especially being a black woman, that I have to fully embrace the fact that, you know, I'm a role model to a lot of people who look at me and think, if she can be there, I can be there. And I think it's a tremendous responsibility on my part to make sure that I live up every day to a notion of both what they can be, what they can aspire to be, that it is possible, that it's accessible, that I can help them, that there's humility involved in it. So while it is there um, and something that I hope can be inspirational that I, and that I hope I do it justice, but that I, that I hope it's also something that people see is something that's not only attainable, but that it's a weight that they can carry easily, you know, and that they're, they're proud to do it. And anybody who's in this role, like I am, and there, there are, there are people others than, than me in this role, you know, that they are lending a hand to other people to show them the way. I feel really similarly. And, you know, I think back to when I was starting the muse and, you know, I, I remember going to a presentation for one of the big startup incubators and uh, it was 
entirely men on stage and wow. thinking, you know, I almost, I actually, um, I had gone to that event planning to apply to the incubator and I left, um, having decided not to apply. And luckily a woman that I know basically kicked my butt the day that the application was due. <laughs> and she's like, you can't not apply. If I'm going to give them grief for not accepting a diverse set of entrepreneurs, the best female entrepreneurs I know can't sit out the application process. So, you know, just get in there. But yeah. it, it is really true that you can't be what you can't see. And I think that that's why it is so powerful to have, you know, across corporate America, across technology, across advertising and agency to really have visible examples of all types of people being successful, because it does give uh, those people who are early in their career, this sense that, that I too could get there someday. Yeah. And I agree. And I'm glad that you went ahead and did it, right? Because that will make it easier for the next woman to do it. And you made it possible for men to see you as naturally belonging there, right? Because you were there. I'm sure you represented extraordinarily well. And so I think that, you know, it's not always easy to do it, but we, we need to stand firm and be in our roles. And, um, and let everybody see that it's possible we're doing it without a tremendous amount of sweat <laughs> and that we can, we can bring other people along with us. But yeah, I do think it's important to show up. And, and, and that's why, while I, I completely understand when a woman CEO says, don't call me a female CEO, I'm a CEO. I don't mind at all being, you know, a black woman professional because that's who I am. And it means something to a lot of people. And it means something to me because it wasn't always easy. And people, when they see me, they see me first as black. They see me first as a woman. And, and that's what I am to the world, you know? So I'm not going to hide behind that. And it's important to other people that it makes them feel that that's also possible for them. So I'm not going to walk away from it. I love that. And by the way, that incubator, we got in and we were the first all female yes. team that we've ever accepted. <laughs> and I never would have had that chance. And frankly, I don't know where the muse would be today if I hadn't gotten that kick in the pants from another woman, which I appreciated. Uh, her name was Rachel Sklar. And right. she was just like, you got to do this. And, um, and it allowed, you know, it, it, it allowed us ultimately to be in the place where we could get this tremendous opportunity and hopefully help others like us and, and other people be able to see themselves in that community. So I'm, I'm really with you there. And I think it's so powerful to just, as you said, accept that and own that. And, and, you know, for me, it can also be very motivating to say, you know, I need to do my best every day, not just for me, but for all of the other people that I want to, to be welcome and successful in this industry too. Well, what you said gave me chills and I, I congratulate you for that because I think it's really, it's great and it's powerful. And as you said, it's motivating. And what I love is that another woman encouraged you, right? Because I do think that we are a huge sisterhood and we get strength for one another. Yeah. It sounds to me like you really built a lot of that, um, into some of the work you've done more broadly at FCB. So I, I came across when I was, you know, reading up for this episode, I came across the intentional inclusion workshops that you yeah. and your team run at FCB. And I, I love this idea. And so I was wondering, would you tell our listeners a little bit about these workshops? You know, are there any takeaways that they can apply from what you've learned in their own workplaces? What sort of impact have you seen I think it's totally amazing to be honest with you, what these workshops can do. These are the kind of workshops where we have people actually come to us and say, Oh, I heard how fantastic it was. Can we come? So that just tells you it's a different, it's a different kind of a workshop. And we used to call it in the very beginning implicit bias, because what it does is show people that they have biases and, and it is human nature it is not a judgment to understand that if you are a human being, you're going to have biases because that's just the way the brain works. So the first thing that we do in our, in our workshops is just to say, here's some basic scientific facts. This is how our brain works. We all have stereotypes. It's a way for us to process information quickly. It's also part of what the socialization is out in the world that we, you know, the way we've taken in information over just hundreds of years that we're going to have biases. 
So what do we need to do to understand those biases? What do we need to do to interrupt those biases? So a lot of it is just sort of self-awareness of where we are in our own lives, in our minds, and to be aware of that. And then the second part is that it's not enough to be aware of your bias. You have to do something with it. You have to be intentionally inclusive of other people. So the other part of it is how do you interrupt the bias and how do you make sure that you make room for other people and are inclusive of people that are different from you? Because frankly, that's where the magic happens, right? (laughs) That's where you learn so much from other people. That's where you probably learn that you have a lot in common. The more diversity inclusion you have, the more creative the work is, the better the company performs, both from a creative point of view and from a financial point of view. So we do a lot of that kind of work in our workshops. But because we're a creative organization, we also show actual work product you know, to show where they may have not quite made the mark or something that is incredibly beautiful that has in fact done well. So we do that within our workshops. We tell people where biases might creep into decision-making. So we do a lot of work, like if there was a hiring situation, where would bias, you know, creep in? Where might it creep in into creative reviews? And so it's a real work session. And I'll just say one last thing. A lot of people will have training and they'll say, okay, we're going to train our whole workforce in this year because we want to get our training done. We want to make sure everybody's trained. But I love what our worldwide CEO said to us. He said, I don't want to rush this training. He said, I want this training to be ever ongoing because I want this conversation to always be going on in the organization. So yeah, roll it out. But Don't roll it out too fast because every year I want people to be in and out of these kind of workshops so that people are always talking about it and people are always engaged in this kind of a discussion. So, and that's what happens. And it's always a topic here and it's always something that's top of mind. You know, you mentioned this before, but it sounds like you really make sure that you also tie back this work and conversation and training and other practices around diversity and inclusion to measurable business results. Absolutely. And when we look at creative work, I mean, we're looking at our own creative work. (laughs) So like, if something didn't quite make the mark, we are talking about it. We're talking about it in our workshops. We're talking about it. We, you know, we deconstruct our work and we try to figure out, okay, what, what happened? When did it happen? Where did we miss it? What conversations didn't take place? But not like this is, this is human life. Mistakes will happen. Where can we what can we do to make sure that we have the right kind of education, we have the right kind of processes so that we don't have those kind of mistakes again, right? And what we found, especially now that we have the CNI communities, is that there's a lot more, there's more of a safety net because people know, people know that if something's not feeling right to them, that they can go to the CNI community and they can say, please take a look at this work because something, I'm not sure. So what the CNI workshops have done is it has generally increased everybody's awareness now so that they, like, if they're not quite, something in my gut is telling me I'm not quite so sure about this campaign and it's making me uneasy, but I don't know why. They know enough now to pick up the phone and say, I want to talk to somebody about this. Can you take a look at it and tell me if there's something off about it? And usually somebody can say it's this element that's making you uncomfortable. And if we do X, Y, or Z, this can make it better. Those are the kind of things that I think has, has really sort of opened the doors within our organization to have a more fluid review and better conversations. It can be an incredibly uncomfortable conversation unless we've had conversations about these things in a safe place so that when you're outside of those workshops, you can continue to have a dialogue where people aren't uncomfortable, or if they're uncomfortable, we can manage the discomfort of having a conversation about say race or gender or whatever it is, and talk about it in terms of somebody's work. And when it's somebody's real life work, they've, they're vested in it, right? So you, you wanna be thoughtful and careful about how you talk about it, but all of us are committed to having the right result. 
Yeah, I love that. You you give people the tools to start to think critically and engage on the issue. You make it safe and expected for people to have these conversations and you let them know where to go when they have questions, which is so powerful. And I love too that the the retrospectives or looking back on what didn't work is a core part of this because I think that's something that businesses could learn so much more from. I'm really surprised yeah. by how few times people take the time to sit down and say, "Hey, this didn't really hit the mark. What went wrong?" Wrong. What can we learn about the process, the output, the data, the decision making, so that we can avoid this in the future? Because it's an incredible opportunity to to learn and to improve, um, you know, the way that that you're going to get work done in the future. So for that, I I will have to say that I am a huge believer in the post mortem. I was at the New York Times and I worked for one of my most favorite people. And she did this on every, it was when I was in the legal department, actually, she did it on every project. And the whole idea was not to assess blame. The whole idea was how do we improve the process so that it's better the next time. And because of the way she taught me how to do that, I have never, I've never looked at any of those kind of things as a blame assessment process. It is, it is a process of making things better. And, and the, thing I love about FCB is one of the things we are defined by is we say never finished, right? We are never finished. So in terms of our creativity, never finished means that if we develop a campaign, it can live in many iterations in the future, right? It has a big, big idea. It can be on many different platforms and it can grow, and it can grow into the next iteration and the idea will grow and grow and grow in the future, right? In terms of people, never finished means that the people we try to hire here at FCB are never finished growing, they're never finished learning, they're endlessly you know, uh, curious, and that's defining who they are. For me, the post-mortem is never finished learning because you're learning from what happened the last time and how can you improve it. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of different areas we can do this. in. if we didn't win a pitch, we can look back at the pitch and we can say, what did we do? That was excellent. What did we do that, you know, we could improve on and learn from that for the next time we do it. It's practice. Right. And so, you know, I think we try hard to make sure that that ethos of never finish learning is embedded in everything we do. I, I really love that. And I think that, you know, I, I joked the other day to someone, I'm like, look, I don't know all the answers, but I will learn faster than almost anyone you ever met. And I think that <laughs> idea of being unfinished and being willing and eager to constantly learn and improve is, is so powerful. And so in closing, I often like to ask my guests to share a piece of advice with our listeners. And so I, I'm wondering, you know, in our audience today, I'm sure we have a lot of folks who are the, you know, quote unquote only on their team and their department and their company, or they're, you know, they're listening to this and they're really motivated to think about, you know, how they can show up better to create a more inclusive future forward workplace, you know, for these people, what, what advice would you have for them? That's a good and tough question. So I'm going to, I'm going to start answering it by giving you just a little story. Early in my career, I was an only. It happened to be one of my early law firms. And I was telling them and introducing myself as Cynthia and was going by the name Cynthia, whereas everybody who's my friend and has known me forever will call me Cindy. And so I went home uh, one night. I was talking to my husband, and I somehow mentioned the fact that they call me Cynthia. And he didn't know that. And he was like, why are you having people call you Cynthia? And I said, well, because this is work and, you know, I don't know these people and like the only person there of color. And so, yeah, they can call me Cynthia. And he said, wow, you're really going to make it hard on yourself, aren't you? You're going to, you're really isolating yourself and you're not giving them any chance to, you're not letting them in. And I was like, oh, Yeah, I guess that's true. I probably let everybody still call me Cynthia for a couple of weeks after that. But (laughs) I think my learning from that was I was self-protecting, right? I was not letting anybody in so they couldn't reject me or they couldn't hurt me or they couldn't, they couldn't do anything to me because I wasn't going to let them because I was putting up this artificial barrier around myself and the, the calling myself Cynthia, the formality of it was just a way of 
you know, surrounding myself and not letting anybody in and letting anybody be close. So I guess my lesson from that and being an only for many, many other times in my career and a lot of times in my career is let people in, take the gamble, understand that when people ask you questions that you might think, gee, don't they know that? Or shouldn't they know that? Have some generosity because usually questions are in an effort to understand and to know and to create a bond as opposed to hurt and do the same, you know, try to make that effort to get to know other people, to be welcoming and to lead with inquiry and, and curiosity as opposed to staying aside and, and self-isolating because that's not going to do you any good. And it's not going to, it's not going to help you feel included, be included, make a difference, help other people, make sure that you're not the only, if you do those kind of things. So I would say jump in with both feet, you know, learn as much as you can and be the kind of person that you would want everybody else to be that you work with. Be unafraid. It's just really important not to be afraid. And I, I, I think that's obviously so much easier to say than to do, you know, but go on with courage because what is it that anybody really can do to you? I mean, we own our lives. We take care of our own place in this world and we create our paths. And if something isn't working for us, then we will create another path. But, you know, go in there with self-confidence and be who you are and just own your space then do it with a little courage. I, I couldn't agree more. And so for anyone who's listening, who has been, you know, excited or inspired, or is just really interested in learning more about FCB, where should they go? Well, that would be terrific. And they should um, come to fcb.com. And that will also show them all of our social channels that we have on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and we would be delighted if they, if they would do so. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for the time that you spent with me today and, and for all of this. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I had, a, I had a terrific time with you as well. It was a great conversation. Wonderful. And for all of you, tune in next week for the new rules of work. The Muse is the best place to research companies and careers. More than 75 million people each year trust The Muse to help them win at work, from finding a job to building the skills to help them grow and advance. Organizations use our platform to attract and hire talent by providing an authentic look at company culture, workplace, and values through the stories of their employees. You've been listening to The New Rules of Work. To learn more about this episode and to research companies and jobs, visit the muse.com to ensure you never miss an episode subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast player if you have any questions for the muse or for host Catherine Minshew feel free to reach out to press at the muse.com thank you for listening until next time